Welcome everyone. If you have any other questions, queries, or, or any other issues, please feel free to reach out to us at webinars at secafrica.org.za. For now, I'm going to hand over to Betty Cormier, who's our speaker today. Uh, thank you uh, for this uh, introduction. So um, I'm Betty Cormier. I'm a postdoc at NTNU in Norway uh, in the Biotox group. And uh, I'm an aquatic ecotoxicologist, so today I'm going to mainly talk about the ecotoxicological impacts of microplastic on aquatic organisms. Um, so the, the presentation today will be mainly uh, on ecotoxicology and the microplastic problematic in ocean, how we are sampling microplastic and the different toxicity that uh, microplastic can cause. And I will, at the end of this presentation, I will just focus on one scientific mission that I've done to explain you a bit what we are doing. And I will just finish briefly uh, with my current research at Antonio. So what is ecotoxicology first? Because I'm always uh, talking about ecotoxicology, but I'm sure um, most of the people, they have no clue about what is ecotoxicology. So ecotoxicology, it's basically the science or the study of the impacts of chemical, physical, or biological factors on all living organisms. So in my case, I'm working on the study of pollutants impact on ecosystem, but on the microplastic impacts on aquatic ecosystem. Um, to introduce you the topic that I'm going to talk about uh, today, I will just um, show you a quick video that we've made during the, the scientific mission uh, in Guadalupe, Archipelago. And so this video was made for the European Parliament. And I hope you will better understand the, the topic of microplastic problematic in ocean. Il ne sera pas possible de supprimer la pollution plastique des océans. Ces plastiques, on va les voir, c'est une pollution visuelle à la surface des océans, vous allez les trouver aussi sur les plages parce qu'il y, y a des plastiques qui flottent en surface et c'est euh, ce que l'on voit. Mais ce qu'il faut savoir aussi, c'est que c'est qu'une petite partie de l'iceberg, la grosse partie des plastiques va être sous forme de petites particules qui vont se retrouver dans, enfouies euh, dans les océans, dans les sédiments et qu'on ne verra pas et qu'on ne pourra jamais éliminer. Queste microplastiche che sappiamo oggi che vengono ingerite da tutti gli organismi. Abbiamo dati che ci evidenziano che dal 30 al 70% degli organismi presenta almeno una particella eh, di microplastiche nei propri eh, tessuti, nel proprio contenuto stomacale, che è un numero enorme se si pensa a quanti animali vivono in mare. Ces petits plastiques peuvent pénétrer très profondément dans le corps des organismes marins et induire des effets toxiques. Ils vont les confondre avec du plancton et du coup vont, euh, vont s'alimenter avec ces plastiques. Ces euh, microplastiques vont passer comme ça dans la chaîne alimentaire. Ce qui va poser des problèmes euh, de toxicité éventuelle euh, pour ces organismes. Des effets qui peuvent être de la, une diminution de la croissance, une modification de leur reproduction et euh, dans certains cas peuvent induire aussi des perturbations endocriniennes. Ces plastiques, on peut les retrouver partout dans le monde. Ils voyagent grâce au courant marin. Ce canard en plastique qui a été déversé dans l'océan Pacifique à l'occasion d'un accident de bateau fait le tour de la Terre en l'espace de quelques années. On a retrouvé dans l'Atlantique, dans l'océan Indien. Tout ce matériel qui est dans l'atmosphère, dans le bouquet, 
nell'ambiente non sai quanto durerà. Le problème de ces plastiques, c'est qu'ils mettent énormément de temps à se dégrader, mais une fois à l'état de microplastique, ils vont mettre encore des centaines de milliers d'années à se dégrader. Si Christophe Colomb avait jeté une bouteille en plastique à la mer, il y a beaucoup de chances pour qu'on ait retrouvé cette bouteille sous forme de microplastique à l'heure actuelle. So, um, yeah. I hope you better understood uh, the problematic of microplastic uh, because mainly when we are talking about plastic um, pollution in ocean and yesterday or two days ago, I just used Google and I just look for plastic in the ocean animals. And what you can see, it's mainly uh, turtles, birds, again turtles and mammals um, with big plastic pieces. So the problem with plastic uh, right now is that we're mainly focusing um, at showing what's happening with big organisms and big plastic items. But what about microplastics? So microplastics, there are uh, plastic particles below five millimeter. And uh, here you can see uh, the problematic with microplastic is that if you were going below five millimeter, all organisms can ingest them. While if we are only using a big plastic particle, of course, only big animals can ingest the plastic. So microplastic is a broad topic and it can impact all aquatic organisms. Like you can see fish and vertebrates, mammals, reptiles, all of them. Uh, we have two types of microplastic that uh, exist. So we have the, what we call primary microplastic. So those are the microplastic that were manufactured at the micro size uh, scale. So those are, for example, the micro bits that we can find in cosmetics or personal care products. We also have a microplastic in industrial scrubbers uh, for abrasive glass cleaning. And the main uh, category of primary microplastic are the virgin resin pellets that are used to drain the, the manufacture of plastic items. So they're just using uh, those small, tiny pieces of plastic. They will melt the plastic and then they will create a bottle or whatever. And we also have the secondary microplastic. So those one are some microplastic that are from bigger uh, plastic items. So for example, we have microfibers uh, in the environment and those came mainly from textiles. So when we are washing textiles, then we are releasing a lot of microfibers in the environment. We also have the transport that is a source of microplastic in the environment. So with the erosion of the tires and the boats cutting, uh, we can find a lot of microparticles uh, of plastic from the transport. And last but not least, the microplastic breakdown. So through physical or chemical degradation and also biological degradation from a big piece of plastic, we can get uh, down to micro and sometimes nanoparticles of plastic. So when I prepared this presentation, I found this carton uh, and I thought, okay, that's a funny one. Like we need to give uh, underwater guide to microplastic to fish. Uh, but it's not really funny because that's the reality. So that's what we can find in the environment. And something that we know about microplastic is that if we compare microplastic to pesticides, for example, pesticides, if you're using glyphosate, for example, just one of them, uh, glyphosate is one molecule and there is nothing around. It's just this uh, 
molecule in chemistry. Microplastic, we have thousands of thousands of thousands uh, different microplastic, and we can't get two identical particles. So here you can see this is a, a picture from um, photo contest that we've done in, in 2017. And one researcher just took a picture of different microplastic particles, and you can see that they all differ in shape, colors, um, size also, and all of them will have different properties. So all the properties that one particle have will have an impact on the toxicity. So microplastic, they're of course made uh, of polymers. So we have different uh, polymer types and this will have also an impact on the, on the toxicity. So you can't just say microplastic or toxic or uh, non-toxic. You have to define the, the polymer type. And something that is also really important in microplastic toxicity is that when we are manufacturing either micro or plastics, bigger uh, plastic items, we are using additives to modify the, the properties of the plastic itself. So we are adding pigments to get red plastic tubes or blue plastic tubes. We can also use plain retardant, pesticide, or UV filter, whatever, to just increase or modify uh, the properties of the plastic. And those additives will also have an impact uh, on the toxicity of the microplastic. Then, uh, once in the environment, microplastic will act as a, I call it a sponge. So the microplastic will absorb all the chemicals, all the hydrophobic chemicals in the environment. So really acting like a sponge. So the microplastic will just get all the, the chemicals and we know that microplastic can uh, store metal uh, and also persistent organic pollutants as PHEs, pesticides, but also pharmaceuticals. And the presence of those pollutants can also have an impact on the toxicity. And finally, we have the, the biofilm. So what is the biofilm is basically when a plastic is entering into the, the environment, through weathering, it will just be a small particle. And uh, we can have a community of different algae attached to the particle. And this will modify the transport of the particle, but also modify the toxicity of the particle because the biofilm itself, so it's like a layer of algae uh, and zooplankton, those can also absorb some pollutants and they can just modify the, the microplastic itself. So this will have an impact. So what I'm looking for is that among all of uh, these parameters, are microplastic really toxic? But before to know if they are toxic, we need to sample them. And so to sample them, we have a different methods. So the first one is we're going to the field and we sample aquatic organism in the environment. And so for example, here uh, we were sampling fish and just to see if they were contaminated with microplastic and to characterize the microplastic that we were able to find in the organism. Then we are also collecting microplastic on the beach. So for example, we are using quadra. So this is a quadra. So it's a, a square that we're just putting on the sand. And inside this, uh, we are taking some subsamples to characterize the, the pollution on the beach. So then we are sieving, you can see here, we are just sieving the sand and trying to collect the microplastic. Uh, if we want to collect microplastic in the water, we have different uh, options to do it. So the most common one uh, is the montanet. So this is, uh, this is the montanet. So it's just a net that we are dragging um, on the way on the surface water and we will collect uh, everything in this. And then we will just filter the water 
and on the filters, uh, we will try to find and pick the microplastics. So either by N, so that's like such a long time. Otherwise, we have also some instrument that can uh, measure if a polymer is detected on the, the filter. Then we can also collect microplastic in the column water using the Nisking bottle. So it's a tube and we're just putting the, the tube in the water. And when we are at 10 meters, for example, we will just close the bottle and we will sample the water at 10 meters uh, below the sea level. And so we will all also filtrate the water and try to get out the microplastic. And for the sediments, uh, we have the Van Vin grab. So we're just, you saw it in the video, we are just like uh, using this grab, collecting some sediments and again, filtrating and trying to extract microplastic. And so I just uh, decided to, for this presentation, to give you a broad view of the microplastic toxicity. So it's not one specific toxicity that I'm going to focus on, neither one apoptotic organisms, but just to give you a broad uh, view of the, of the toxicity. So the first thing that uh, we know is that microplastic can be ingested by, by animals. So the first uh, real picture of animal contaminated with microplastic is this one, uh, where they just discovered that inside one fish, they were able to collect those particles of plastic. And that was really the beginning of, of the microplastic problematic. And since then, uh, in lab, we are trying to repeat uh, the ingestion of microplastic to see how they're behaving in the, in the organism. And so, for example, here they were using Artemia salina, so it's a small crustacean, and they were giving uh, different sizes of microplastics. So here you can see one, three, six, and 10 microns. And so they are fluorescent, so we can just uh, know where the microparticles are inside the organism. And you can see that the artemia is really eating the plastic. And we can see that the plastic is going through the organism. So from the, the mouth of the organism, and then will just be excreted through the, the feces. And here it's another crustacean, it's a Daphnia magna. Uh, so this is a normal Daphnia magna, uh, non exposed to microplastics. So you can see some picture. And this is when um, we kind of dissolve the organism. So all the organic matter is dissolved here. And here they exposed some Daphnia magna magna to, to microplastic. And we can see that Daphnia magna really ingest microplastic and all the gut was filled with microplastic. So this is another picture just to, to see it better because the microplastic were red. And here you can see that all the organic matters disappeared except uh, the polymer. So then we have the microplastic bioaccumulation. So this is a study that we've done in, in, in France last year. Uh, so we were exposing oysters. So if you don't know, this is the oyster larvae. So usually we are using the, what we called D larvae. So the first stage of, of the larvae, the free swimming larvae of oysters. And we expose them uh, over a few hours to microplastic. And we saw that after one hour, the larvae did ingest some microplastics, but after five hours, they did ingest more microplastics. So they're bioaccumulated the microplastic and they're keeping the microplastic in their body. And this can have an impact uh, later, but we will see it later. And we've also done the same with uh, marine medaca, so uh, a marine fish that is commonly used in laboratory. And this is the fish eggs. And at the surface of the marine medaca eggs, we have 
what we called willy. So it's kind of some hair, sticky hair. And here uh, you can't really see it. So you have to trust me for those ones. Uh, here we can see that microplastic gets stuck on the eggs. So at, outside of the, of the eggshell, we saw some microplastic and here you can see them. So this is a microscopic view. And here we saw that on the villi, the microplastic gets stuck. And over the time, the amount of microplastic increased. And this can also have an impact because the fish will be covered by, by microplastic and uh, it will affect the development of the fish. We also know that microplastic can translocate. So uh, some studies have been uh, done on mussels, so two types of mussels, the common mussel and the Mediterranean mussel. And so they were uh, exposing mussel in the environment, so in the water uh, to microplastics. And they saw that microplastic went to the gut cavity and you can see also some microplastic polystyrene microsphere here in the digestive tract. But they also found some microplastic in the emolith of the muscle. So the emolith is the blood of the muscle. So the microplastic translocates from the, the gut cavity or the digestive tube through the blood, so the emolith of the muscle. And this is the, the, the same experiment with another muscle where they found also uh, some microplastic, small microplastic into the emolith of, of the muscle. So now we know that some microplastic can migrate from the digestive tube to the, to the different organs and cells. And this, like, this accumulation and bioaccumulation of microplastic can have an impact on the, the growth and the different developmental stage of an aquatic organism. And this is a larvae of a sea hurricane. So I'm pretty sure that most of you didn't know that this triangle thing was um, a baby sea hurricane. So this is how it, it is in normal life, so it's a, a nice triangle with four arms. And when we expose the sea hurricane larvae to a uh, different concentration of, of microplastic, we saw that um, the arm were not that long and we lost the, the symmetry also. And if we increase the concentration of microplastic, the larvae were really unnormal and the thing is that this specific larvae won't go to the adult stage because um, the mouse of the sea hurricane will develop here. And we can see here that the mouse is not developing. So the larvae will just die uh, because of the presence of, of microplastic in the environment. And another studies, they, they use the, the xena. So, this is uh, a frog and this is uh, the larvae of this frog and they exposed um, the, the xenopus uh, larvae to some microplastic fibers. So this is a normal larvae when exposed to fiber and we can see that when they expose the larvae to, to microfibers, uh, the, the gut cavity here uh, was deformed by the presence of, of microfibers. So the microfiber really uh, did affect the, the, the formation of the gut and the digestive tract. And so those larvae won't uh, be able to, to digest correctly what they will eat at an adult stage. So they will also, also die because of the presence of microfibers at the larvae stages. We also noticed some inflammatory symptoms, sorry. So again, using the common muscle. Uh, in black, uh, those are uh, some muscles that were not exposed again to, 
to microplastic. And here they use uh, high density polyethylene and they exposed the muscle to, to high density polyethylene in the environment. And what they saw is that over time, they saw an increase of granulocytoma formation. So this is the granulocytoma is the, the blue uh, thing in this picture. And basically those granulocytes, they're made to in an inflammatory responses just to kind of destroy the, the problem that the cell detects. So in this case, the microplastic. So here they are just like the cell is trying to destroy the plastic. So they will just create um, this kind of envelope around the microplastic to excrete them. And that's what we measure. So we measure the amount of, of those envelope in the cells to see if there is an inflammatory response to the, to the presence of microplastic. And one uh, really important uh, impact that microplastic can, can cause is uh, the reprotoxicity. So for example, using the zebrafish, the most common used fish in, in ecotoxicology and in toxicological studies, um, they were measuring the apoptotic cells in testes. So the apoptose is when a cell is just uh, dying by itself to protect the other. So they will just cause a necrosis and the cell will just um, get destroyed by itself to protect the, the surrounding cells. And this is happening when uh, there is a pollutant, then the cell will just try to destroy themselves to create some new cells to, to fight against the, the pollutants. And so they did measure the percentage of apoptotic cells in the testes of the zebrafish uh, using different concentration of polystyrene microplastic. And they saw that the, the amount, the percentage of apoptotic cells really increased when the fish were exposed to, to polystyrene microplastic. And using the Daphnia magna, so this uh, small crustacean that I, I told you about before, uh, they were counting uh, neonates or the, the newborns of the, of the Daphnia magna, and they were exposing also Daphnia magna to different concentration of, of microplastic, polystyrene microplastic, and they saw a really high decrease of the number of neonates where the concentration, when the concentration of polystyrene increased. So, showing that of microplastic in the environment really did impact the, the reproduction of the organism. And also uh, some researchers demonstrated that the, the microplastic can have an impact on the reproduction over generation. So this is just a, a graphical abstract from, a, from a, an article that I found where they were uh, exposing some adult fish to microplastic and they were measuring effects to the, the next generation. And they saw a lot of abnormalities in the developmental stages of either eggs and larvae of, of the, the fish that were exposed. But of course, microplastic can have so many different orders uh, impact. For example, they can cause genotoxicity, so some, uh, some alteration on the DNA itself. Uh, Microplastic can also be vectors for many different pathogens. So for example, uh, Vibrio can get stuck on, on the plastic and can contaminate uh, many organisms. Here, we have um, a video uh, showing the, the behavior of the fish. So here you can see some larvae that are swimming. So this is in daylight. Uh, so they're swimming gently. Uh, some are not swimming at all. And you would see uh, soon 
that we will turn off the light and they will start to get crazy. Uh, so it's coming now. So you can see that they're just moving faster and in all direction. So that's a normal behavior for fish. Uh, when we switch on and off the light, they're stressed. So they will just swim faster and in all direction to escape uh, the stress. But we saw that for some microplastic, when the fish were exposed to microplastic, they are not reacting at all at the switching on and off the lights. This is um, a fish egg. So this is from the marine medica that I, I showed you before. And we can see that we can follow the heartbeat rate of the fish. And we demonstrated that by exposing some, some egg fish to microplastic, the heartbeat rate changed. So really decreased because of the stress. And also, uh, I'm pretty sure that you heard uh, about this paper that just uh, uh, get published uh, two or three weeks ago from our lab. Uh, so they were using consumer products uh, and they demonstrated that the chemicals that are associated with chemical products can uh, increase obesity in, in humans uh, by doing, they use different bioassays and non-target analyses showing that the presence of all chemicals uh, in plastic can really have an impact on organisms, but also humans. So it's not just, uh, a random uh, thing that we are creating. It's really a bomb, <laughs> as I, 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 I like to say. Um, and now I, I'm just gonna show you a bit uh, some results that we've got uh, from a scientific mission that we've done with Race for Water. So using this boat. So we went to, that's the, all the trip of the boat and they were collecting microplastic sample uh, across the entire world to, to try to explain the toxicity of microplastic. And we've been to, to Guadalupe Archipelago, so a French archipelago, and we did collect some microplastics. And we used the zebrafish as a model organism. So this is the zebrafish and this is uh, zebrafish embryos uh, in the egg and then the larvae. So we are using zebrafish mainly because we can easily breed this fish in laboratory because they're quite small and we have a year round spawning so we can get eggs every day uh, along the, the year. And they are easy to reproduce. And as you can see, the embryos and larvae are transparent. So as I showed you, we can uh, follow, for example, the herd. Uh, we can also follow the development of the eyes and so on. So what we've done, um, we used what we called F0 generation. So we exposed some larvae to the adult uh, stage, some fish to 1% of microplastic collected on, in Guadalupe, we put it in the food. So to be sure that the fish will ingest the microplastics. And we fed them for almost five months. And at the end, when they were able to reproduce, we bred the F1 generation, what we call it F1 generation. So new embryos uh, to the larvae stage, larval stage. But those fish were unexposed to microplastics. So only the parents were exposed to the, the, the plastics, but the F1 generation was not exposed to microplastic at all. And so for the F0 generation, we followed the chemical contamination. So we gave them some microplastic contaminated with pollutants from the environment. And we were looking at the concentration of pollutants in the fish to see if the microplastic released uh, the pollutants. Uh, we were also uh, measuring them uh, to see if the microplastic had an impact on the, on the growth and on the survival of the fish. 
we followed some parameters uh, related to the reproduction, so the reproductive success, the amount of eggs, but also the fertilization rate to see if microplastic did have an, an impact on the, the reproduction uh, parameters. And we measure some specific biomarkers uh, at the cellular and molecular level to really see where the microplastic had an impact. So in the brain, the muscles, the liver, and we also sample uh, the gonads. And on the fish that were not exposed, so the, let's say, son and daughters of, of the parents that were exposed, we measure them uh, to see if the presence of microplastic to the parents did have an impact on the growth of the next generation. Also on the larval behavior, so if they were uh, able to swim uh, normally, because I didn't tell you that, but we are following the behavior of the fish because it's related to the neurotoxicity. So if the fish um, is exposed to a neurotoxic compound, the fish won't be able to swim normally. And we also uh, measure the larval survival of the fish by monitoring the larval survival. Uh, so we saw some growth uh, alterations. So here are the, the microplastics. So we expose some fish to different type of microplastic that we collect. And we saw for the female that the, the weight really decreased when the fish were exposed to microplastic. And for the reprotoxicity, we saw that normally the fish are uh, spawning quite well. So when we are putting one male and one female uh, we can get eggs almost uh, every time. And it really decreased when we expose the fish to, to microplastics. So microplastics really had an impact on the, on the reproduction of the fish. And for the next generation, so the, the larvae unexposed, uh, I won't go into detail, but basically we are just measuring the distance traveled by the larvae. So this is during light period, then night, and then light again. And we saw that fish that were exposed to microplastic uh, went crazy. And they were just like swimming uh, really fast in all direction um, because the microplastic feeding to their parents uh, did affect their uh, central nervous system. So from this scientific mission, we showed, we, we demonstrated that when we exposed adults, uh, the microplastic increased the metabolic cost and decreased the food consumption. We also demonstrated that microplastic can act as endocrine disruptors and can also have an impact on the next generation with bad egg quality, maternal transfer of chemical from the microplastic to the, the next generation and also um, have an impact on the neurotoxicity. And what I'm doing now uh, at NTMU, so I'm working within Reveal Project. Uh, so I'm working on the first is the, how can we degrade plastic into micro and nanoplastic? So in chemistry, how is it possible and how this can happen? Uh, what can we get? So we will use some plastic bags uh, from the stores and we will degrade them to micro and nanoplastics. And we will also use some specific yarns that are used to make, uh, to make a like jacket in Norway, for instance. Um, and so we will degrade them and we will uh, try to see the toxicity of the degraded materials in comparison with the microplastic that we can find in the environment uh, against some plastic that were not degraded at all. So I'm gonna use the, the Daphne Magnia from this. And yeah, thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, just ask them. Uh, thank you so much, Betty. That was very interesting. Um, and yeah, it, it's very interesting to hear about all the work, all the research that's been done, as well as the, the research that you're doing on the biodegradable products as well. 
Um, I see there is a question in the Q&A box or, already that says, are there any solutions for removing the microplastics already in the oceans? And are there any companies that are actually working on removing these microplastics in the ocean? Uh, so, yes, there are some uh, trying to remove microplastic, uh, but it's always easier to remove uh, bigger plastic items, like plastic bags that you can find in the environment. But anyway, some, uh, some specific companies are trying to, to remove microplastics. It's not really efficient uh, right now, because the thing is that microplastic the biggest microplastic that you can find is half a centimeter. So it's really small already, but microplastic can go to, down to the nano size. And this is impossible to, to collect. So we have to, we have to live with uh, the microplastic and nanoplastic in the ocean, unfortunately, uh, because we can't remove them. Because if we want to remove micro and nanoplastic, we will also need to remove uh, zooplankton uh, and so on. So we can't just uh, destroy the nature to get rid of micro and nanoplastics. So, but some companies are trying to at least collect the biggest microplastic. Uh, so like down to, uh, let's say, five millimeter to two millimeter, but not below. Okay, uh, and then I see there's a, a question in the chat that says, what methods are you using for degradation? I'm assuming that's in relation to um, the work, your, your work that you spoke of. Yeah, so that's, uh, that's ongoing. <laughs> so what we are uh, trying to do is to, uh, the best way would be just to put the microplastic in the environment and, and see what's happening, but we don't have uh, 10 years in front of us to do it. So um, we will use UVC uh, to mimic the UV degradation, but in a fast way. So instead of using UVA and UVB, we would go for UVC. Okay, um, it, it's very interesting. I was actually just having a, a conversation with a colleague this morning about the fact that things will generally biodegrade, but they will take much longer to do so. so quite interesting. Uh, there was a response to the earlier comments um, asking if you can provide the names of those companies that are trying to remove microplastics. Yeah, sure. I, I, I have them. I just, I just need to stop sharing my screen. Uh, you, you can also, um, we can also send that out uh, after, after the session if, yeah, yeah, <laughs> if you don't yeah, manage I, to find them quite now. Um, yeah, because I have them, but uh, yeah, I don't know where, but I have them <laughs> for sure. Perfect. Okay, uh, and then there's a, another question that says, do you try um, to investigate microplastic concentrations in the natural environments of these organisms and did the microplastic concentrations used in your experiment reflect the environmental levels? Yeah, uh, that's, uh, that's one of the, the tricky questions that we have right now. Uh, among all researchers uh, working with microplastic is which concentration are we aiming uh, in, in the lab? because um, a lot of studies uh, did report the microplastic concentration in some specific areas, but for now we still don't know the real concentration of microplastic in, in the environment because it's, it's depending on the method that are used uh, to, to evaluate the, the contamination, uh, the area, and also the, the size that you are looking for. So if we are looking at microplastic down to 100 micrometer, that's quite easy to do. But then if we are going to like microplastic down to one micro, then it's, it's almost impossible to do uh, at the moment. And the nanoplastic, uh, we can't measure nanoplastic right now in the environment. So in the study that we are doing, um, we are trying to keep the environmental concentration that we know uh, so far. So the one that I showed you on the, mm, 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 this one, the one when we went to Guadalupe, we fed the fish with 1% of microplastic in the food. And this is the concentration that uh, fish might be exposed to. So in the environment, we assume that 
they can ingest up to one to three percent of microplastic in the food. Okay, um, I would imagine that it would the concentrations would vary quite a bit in terms of the area. In the study that you spoke of, that um, seem, seemed to follow quite a um, quite a sort of standard path around uh, sort of around the equator. Were they checking for different levels in each of those locations, or were they just collecting samples? I, I mean, as you said, it's quite quite a challenge to to assess the levels in the environments. But I was just curious if they if they measured it in any way, or if there were any sort of rough trends. So the thing is that you mean for the scientific mission that I showed you, right? Yeah, so they were trying to, that's why they were uh, sailing around the world just to try to evaluate the concentration of microplastic along the way. And in, uh, in Guadalupe, we basically sampled everything <laughs> uh, that we were able to sample. And then we exposed organism only to the concentration uh, related uh, to the concentration that we can find in the environment. So, yeah, we did not expose the, the fish to everything that we did collect, but I'm sure that we underestimated the, the, the problem because we were uh, standing on the beach for like hours uh, to collect microplastic, but of course, we missed maybe half of them, maybe 90% of them. Uh, we don't know because we can't go to the nanoplastic. Uh, anyway, Certainly so. to, to that scale, that, that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. yeah. Um, in, in terms of the, the effect that the microplastics will have on reproduction as well as the probability of juveniles be, become, reaching adulthood, um, have any projections been done on the impact that that will have on fish stocks? Yeah, some studies, they are doing it because now that we know that microplastic can have an impact over generation, and I just show you for the first generation, but some studies, they did to like up to five generations, so only the parents were exposed, and we can see effects until the, the fifth generation. Um, I know that some studies are doing it on the fish stock, but I don't have the data, so I don't want to, to say something wrong about it. So, yeah. of, of course. Um, I, I just had uh, one last question. I see we're slightly over time, but in the experiments that you've been running, um, the microplastics that you've been introducing into this system, have those, um, are there any kind of, uh, is there any data on the um, chemicals or additives that may be a part of those, um, a part of introduced into the system in addition to the microplastics? Yeah, uh, so I, I didn't show you the all the all the parameters, but we we characterized everything on those on those plastics, and we were able to find pesticides, PAHs, PCBs, uh, metals, pharmaceuticals, also, and some specific additives that are uh, related to to the plastic itself. So. That's why at first I said that we can't really answer the question are microplastic toxic because then it's just depending on so many different parameters, including all chemicals. So, yeah. uh, of course, of course, yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, so, so, so the microplastics that you introduced in your various studies, were there any kind of any studies done on what what effect those um, those additional parameters would have. So for example, if, if it was just the, the sort of microplastics that hadn't been exposed to any of the additional chemicals, would those have a different impact as opposed to ones um, with a number of additives? Yeah, so we've also done it with some specific uh, like bullets that were like industrial uh, microplastic so without chemicals. And then we artificially spiked those microplastics with some specific chemicals that we know everything about. And we saw that for some specific um, toxic parameters, it didn't change. So the microplastic was the, the driver of the toxicity. But in some cases, the chemicals was the driver of the toxicity. So for example, the, reprodu the reprotoxicity was exactly the same just with the microplastic. So we know that the microplastic itself was the driver of the toxicity. OK, very, very interesting. Yeah. 
Um, thanks, Betty. I, I don't see any other questions at the moment in the chat or in the Q&A, but if anyone does have any questions at a later stage, you're welcome to, to email us and we'll pass those along to, to Betty. Um, I see we're slightly past 12, um, but I just want to say thank you. Thank you so much, Betty. Um, I, I think we can wrap up here for, for today, but on behalf of all of us at SST, it was, it was really great to uh, to, to hear the research that you're doing. And we really appreciate you taking the time to share with us today. It's been fascinating. Yeah, thanks a lot to you for engaging me. And yeah, just if you have questions, just send them to me. Wonderful. Um, thanks, thanks, Betty. I think, yeah, I think often we, we're aware that microplastics are an issue, but understanding the, the full impact that they have and, and the latest research is, is not always as, as well, uh, as well known <laughs> so mm -hmm. that's great uh okay uh thanks everyone uh, uh, we will let you know once the recording has been uploaded onto youtube and again if you have any questions um for for betty or for finding links or any um future webinars you're welcome to email us at webinars at sccafrica.org.za um thank you everyone and i uh, hope you have a great rest of your wednesday <laughs>